Welcome to this class on reliability. Reliability is one of the two fundamental qualities of tests that we look for. We've talked a lot about validity and validity is about the extent to which we know that the score we get from a test means what we think it means, whether or not we can make sound inferences so that we can go on to make reasonable decisions about whether or not the skills, knowledge, abilities, the constructs that the learner demonstrates are relevant to a criterion context. Reliability is related um, and we think of reliability as something that is part of the concept of validity but is different in a fundamental way in that it's about the psychometric properties of tests, about whether or not it, it, the test actually measures. Now, let's look at reliability defined. And for this purpose, I'm using Robert Lardo's definition, um, which he wrote in his famous book, Language Testing, the first book on language testing specifically, he wrote in 1961. This is a text that isn't referred to much nowadays um, and it really really ought to be. It is a, um, a wonderful book that established the foundations of much that we still do. So Lado's definition of testing, I hope you've been reading it whilst I've been talking because I don't read out things from the screen very frequently unless I want to uh, stress them. Um, he talks about the dependability of scores. Now, this is nice and easy, really. When we talk about dependability or consistency as a definition of reliability, it means if we were to take a measurement twice, would we get the same result? So if, um, let's take a very simple example, which um, I, in fact, gave you in the, um, the, the previous lecture, which were on uh, statistics for language testing. Let's say I wanted to measure someone's height and I had um, a ruler that would do that, you know, traditional tape measure, and I could assess their height four or five times and within a few millimeters, I would get roughly the same measurement. There is going to be some error there because you know, even a fairly stiff measure bends a little bit. Um, if I were to do the same using an elastic band, I would get radically different results each time. So that's the meaning of reliability. Do we get consistent results? Now, notice it's not asking the question, do I know what those results mean? It just means do I get consistent results? So you can get consistent results in this sense from a test that measures something that has nothing to do with the decision context in which you are operating. And therefore the test would not be valid for its purpose, but it would be reliable. Okay, so it's reliability is about the consistency of scores. And this depends on where you think error is likely to occur. So it could be administrations of forms. So let's say you have two or three forms of your test. Okay, so you have two or three administrations, each with a different form. And the question is, if the same test taker took a different form in each of these administrations fairly close together, would they get roughly the same score? If you find that they don't, uh, or the scores fluctuate a great deal, then we would say that the test is not reliable because you're not producing parallel forms. Um, another source of error is markers or raters. So here the question is, um, if a test taker goes into um, a speaking test and there are three or four potential raters or interlocutors, are they likely to get roughly the same score irrespective of which rater they get? 
Now, if they get a radically different score, then there is a problem with what we call inter-rater reliability. That is, raters do not agree on their assessments. And these kind of isolating error that we're concerned with in conducting these studies, if it's raters or administrations with forms, these can be quite expensive to set up because you need multiple administrations, you need the test takers uh, to take two or more forms of a test, and then you've got to randomise the order in which they take the forms um, so that you don't get an order effect and so on. These are quite complex to set up. So what test developers have done over the years is they tend to rely on what we call the internal consistency of the test itself. And I'll explain that in a few minutes. But let's go on to the classical definition of reliability, uh, which is X, and you'll remember that X means the score that any individual gets, equals their true score, that is, their, uh, it, it is a genuine index of their true ability, but it's plus E, which is error. In other words, the error that is associated with forms, with raters, or anything else that can affect the score of the test and change it because of something that is not related to the learner's ability on the construct of interest. So X, or the score, equals the true score plus error. I'm going to move on to uh, reliability as internal consistency. And in reliability's internal consistency, we normally uh, calculate Cronbach's alpha. Um, and when you read the literature on language testing and in fact all of applied linguistics where tests are used, you will find that Cronbach's alpha is the statistic that is reported. Now, this is a measure of internal consistency. Now, what that essentially means is that it asks the question, do the items that are designed to measure the same construct tend to be answered in the same way by individuals and groups. So what we look at is the correlation between items that are intended to measure the same thing. Now you can see why this is a measure of consistency, but it's consistency internal to the test itself. It doesn't uh, it, this measure can only be used with um, closed response items that can be uh, assessed uh, scored as zero on one that is correct or incorrect and of course this was developed by Cronbach um, to assess the reliability or internal consistency of multi tests that were constructed of multiple choice items. <clears throat> now, um, again, I have uh, a spreadsheet, an Excel spreadsheet that calculates Cronbach's alpha, and it asks the question, to what extent are these items related such that if a test taker gets any particular item correct, that is, they show that they have the ability on this construct, do they tend to get the other items correct in the same group? Right, now what I'm going to do, um, of course you download this either from the URL that's on the screen in front of you, or you can scan the barcode and just go to the uh, statistics page. Click on the Excel download uh, button, uh, which is the green one on the page. And opposite, 
Uh, you will also, on the web page, you'll also find a description and further reading um, if you want to know more about how Cronbach's Alpha actually works. Um, and I'm not going to give you the formula for this one um, because we never actually calculate Cronbach's Alpha by hand. Um, it is possible, um, but it's uh, quite tedious. So we're only going to look at how we calculate it uh, using this software. So let's start off by looking at this Excel spreadsheet. Right, here is the spreadsheet. And as you can see, um, I've already populated it with zeros and ones. Um, zero means that um, the person has answered the multiple choice item incorrectly and a one means that they've answered the item correctly. So the zeros are all incorrect responses um, and looking at item two you'll see no one has answered that item correctly so it's, its facility value um, would be zero of course um, meaning it's just far far too hard and its discrimination would be zero because it's not separating out the better and poorer students so we can see that's the case for item two even without doing uh, the kind of item analysis that we've already looked at so we've got all of these ones and zeros and once we've put our ones and zeros in um, in this particular case down here we've got the data input and we've got a second uh, tab at the bottom left which says results and with this all you do is put your zeros and ones into the spreadsheet so that you've got a zero and one main uh, matrix and then you click on results and it tells you that the um, average the mean is 5.2 it also gives you the standard deviation um, and don't worry about the SEM at the moment we're coming to that in a while but alpha is 0 0.59 um, and we could round we well I actually I would probably report that as 0.59 but you could round it up to 0.6 what does that mean well it means that approximately 59% of the variance in these items is uh, variance, reliable variance associated with whatever these items is, are, are measuring. But that means we have 40% or more accurately 41% of the variance which is associated with some kind of error and the question here is is that the kind of level of error in our assessment or measurement that we are prepared to live with now as I'm making this video um, of course uh, we uh, hear on the news every day um, about COVID test and trace and the testing that is done and the reliability of COVID tests. Those tests have a reliability of 0.92 and that's really very, very good. It means that there, if you test positive for COVID-19, the chances are almost certainly that you have COVID-19. With a 0.5, there is a huge chance that your score on this test would be different if you took the test again. There's 40% error in the system. Now, um, I hope you're familiar with SPSS now and have downloaded it and tried using it to calculate um, uh, test statistics for uh, statistics for test analysis. <coughs> and here um, in SPSS um, I have a, a data view and you will see that these are exactly the same zeros and ones that I had in the spreadsheet 
uh, which you have downloaded. And I'm doing this just to show you that you actually get the same results whether you do this with the spreadsheet or you do it in SPSS. I'll just click over to the variable view for a moment. Uh, you can see I've got the 10 items, uh, no decimal places. And you see I've classified this as nominal. And the reason is it's either right or wrong. And that's nominal. You can either be right or wrong. This is not a scale. The items together are a scale. They create a scale. But each item is actually nominal. Now, how do we calculate alpha in SPSS? Well, first of all, we go to Analyze. And last time we looked at descriptive statistics. This time we're going to go all the way down until you get to scale. When you get to scale, the top one, the top uh, item in the um, next menu is reliability analysis. Click on that. And I've already done this, the items. I've moved them from here. Normally they would be in here in the left hand column. You click on them and move them over to the right hand side. You will notice here it says alpha and that's Cronbach's alpha. There are other kinds of reliability in there but alpha is the one we're focusing on because it is the one that's used in applied linguistics and language testing most frequently. If we click on the statistics button at the top right, we want descriptive statistics for each item and the scale that is created by all the items together. You can add means as well, but I'm not going to click on that. Then at the bottom, we just click OK. And here we have the results. So N is 15 because there were 15 students and 10 items. Reliability statistics. Cronbach's alpha 0.591 for 10 items. And that's precisely the same figure that we got with the spreadsheet. Now, if we look at the items down here, we can see the mean. Now, the mean here is exactly the same as the facility value that we would have got from the spreadsheet that you've already looked at that does item facility and point by serial correlation. But SPSS does not do point by serial correlation. Remember on item two, we said no one answered it correctly. So the facility value is zero. Um, you can see items seven and eight. They've got facility values in the center. Item six um, is fairly poor because it's far too difficult. OK, and it tells you that the average score on the scale, that is the 10 items, is 5.2. And it also tells us here the standard deviation. So this also gives us descriptive statistics for the test. That is the scale that is created by these items. So Cronbach's alpha tells us that we have approximately 59% of reliable variance uh, and approximately 41% of error. And we would then do item analysis, we would look at the point by serial, and we would start looking at these and saying, okay, what are the problems here? Which are the items that we would need to alter? And we could push Cronbach's alpha up by improving our items. There are two things that push Cronbach's alpha up. It's the quality of the item itself and the number of the items in a form. So if you increase the number of items, even if you don't improve the quality of the items, 
Cronbach's alpha will go up and that's because you're collecting more information. So, uh, of course, if you have lots of very poor items, Cronbach's alpha will remain low uh, and you ec uh, increase the length of your test and therefore the time it takes learners to do the test. Remember, and this is important, that you can only use Cronbach's alpha to assess the reliability of items that are measuring the same construct. So let me give you an example. If you have a reading test that has 10 items that are assessing um, reading, uh, say skimming, and 10 items that are assessing the ability to understand complex vocabulary, those are two different constructs. If you put the items together into a reliability analysis and the items are genuinely measuring different constructs, Cronbach's alpha will come down because there, is, there should be little internal consistency between items measuring different constructs. So how do we interpret reliability? Okay, so um, anything above uh, alpha 0.9 is excellent. So in other words, we're getting you know 90% uh, plus reliable results. That is internal consistency. This would also be true if we got 90% agreement between raters. It, it, in social sciences, this doesn't get much better. Uh, than 0.9 plus. Um, in other disciplines, um, particularly medicine, you want tests that detect disease or viruses, for example, well in excess of 0.9. But we're dealing with human judgment, with the construct human construction of tests, and this is very, this is this is excellent stuff. As you come down, uh, you've got uh, 0.9 to 0.8. This is the good range. Frequently, language tests are released and are used in the 0.8 to 0.7 range, and we say that's acceptable. But I am not personally convinced that only having between 70 and 80% reliability um, is appropriate and I'll give a reason for that um, when we come on to the next section. Um, as we go down um, we get questionable, poor and completely unacceptable. Um, you see the results for our test uh, with our 10 items was actually in the poor range at uh, 0.59, uh, 0.6.59. So we would have to do a lot of work on those items uh, to get them up to um, scratch. There's a hazard warning with this and I've already talked about it. Um, really concentrate on the quality of items rather than the number. Um, if you had a multiple choice test with a hundred items you would get decent internal consistency but there is no guarantee that the items are really very good at all. Um, so you still need to do your item analysis. And the reminder, only use um, uh, alpha with items that are measuring the same construct. Now, um, the next section is about the standard error because the most important use of an estimate of reliability, uh, particularly alpha, is that we can then use it to estimate the amount of error associated with a test score. And this is exceptionally powerful because it helps us to understand the uncertainty um, that we have in making decisions that are associated with a test score. So it helps us understand 
how we make inferences and how we make decisions. So this is about living with uncertainty. And here you can see I've got another formula. But now this is really, really straightforward because you already know all of this stuff. Now, the scores here are from the test that we looked at in the previous lecture uh, when we were talking about um, statistics for lang uh, assessing language tests. And if you remember, we had um, a, a, a test that had 30 items and you remember the mean was uh, 11.2 and the standard deviation was 7.5. Now in that test, I'm not going to do it now, but in that test the reliability was actually 0.95 which of course is excellent according to our um, rules of thumb. Now the standard error tells us how much error there is in the test and it is the standard deviation square root of 1 minus r. Now there are two ways of doing this on a calculator and I will show you how it's done and then I'll show you again in SPSS. So standard deviation 7.5 reliability 0.95. So this bit here, the 1 minus r, okay, 1 minus r, 1 minus 0.95 equals 0 0.05. So we've got 0 0.05 in here. On a statistical calculator, you can do it one of two ways 7.5 square root of 0 0.05, or you could do 0 0.05, 7.5. Doesn't matter which way you do it, the standard error is 1.75. Now, that in itself doesn't help us a lot, but what we can do is start to express this, the standard error, in terms of the scores on the test. And how we do that is as follows. We take the standard error, and we multiply it by 1.96 because 1.96 is the 95% confidence in interval. Now, just take my word for it that it is 1.96. This is a constant. It does not change. And the reason for this is that 1.96 is the standard deviation at which 5% of the scores would fall at the top and bottom end outside in the 5% range. That's 2.5% at the top and 2.5% at the bottom. Okay, we don't need to look at that, but it's to do with the curve of normal distribution. Just take it that 1.96 is a constant. So we multiply the standard error by 1.96 and this gives us 3.43. We can therefore be 95% certain that if a test taker on our test took the test again, they would get the same score plus or minus 3.43. So, let's say a test taker got a score of 11 on the first test. If they took the test again, we would be 95% certain that their score would be 11 plus or minus 3.43, which would give us somewhere between 8 and 14. Now, that's quite a large range, plus or minus three. But this is the, even with very high reliability, this is the kind of error that feeds through 
into our understanding of the score when we know what the level of reliability is and what the level of error is within our test. And I call this living with uncertainty because it tells us whether or not the score is consistent. We only get one score from a student. They take a test and the score is a one-off. But we can then say, well, what would be the likelihood that they would get the same score if we were to test them again? And <clears throat> that level of uncertainty is what the standard error tells us. I'm back in the Alpha Excel spreadsheet for the uh, 15, uh, 15 test takers and 10 items. And I go into results. And now you can see alpha is 0.59. And the standard error of measurement is given underneath it. And here it's 1.21 and lots of decimal places. We go to two decimal places, so it's 1.22 that we would report. Now, 1.22 multiplied by our constant, 1.96 equals 2.39. So that translates back into our items. Whatever score a learner got the first time they took this 10 item test, their score if they took the test again would be 2.39, it would be the same score, plus or minus 2.39. So if I got a score of 5, my score on the second test, if I took the test again, would be anywhere between 5 minus 2, that's 3, or 5 plus 2, that's 7. So anywhere between 3 and seven and that's how much error we have in that particular test. So now you've got the concept of a standard error and how we take that standard error which is directly related to reliability. We multiply it by 1.96 and that tells us the range within which we would expect someone to score on future administrations of the test. Well, not future, it's assuming that no learning has taken place. So if we gave them the test again, you know, and no learning had taken place. So this feeds through into decision scenarios. And I really don't think that teachers, um, or indeed people who use test scores, in decision making, take the standard error and the 95% confidence interval around a score seriously enough. Let's look at these two scenarios. First one, Emma is applying for a place, a college place, to study mathematics. The admissions officer wants a score of 12 on a reading test. Emma scores 11. Do you reject Emma's application? Well, let's say that we know that the error range around a score is plus or minus 3, which is what we've been looking at in the example so far. Uh, an uninformed admissions officer might say, no, she hasn't got the grade, we're not accepting her. But the fact of the matter is that a score of 11 is well within the error range. The consequences of making a decision error are not that serious because Emma's going to study mathematics. 
And, of course, in a university context, if the tutors find that her reading ability in mathematics isn't really up to scratch, there are support programmes to help Emma improve her reading. So the decision context isn't particularly high stakes. She's well within the error range. And the admissions officer, in this case, really should accept Emma. If the admissions officer did not do so, Emma would have grounds for complaint, in my view. Let's look at the next one. Joe is applying for a job as a civil aircraft engineer that requires reading technical manuals in English. He also has to take a reading test, but this is a reading test of technical English. The recruitment office offices, uh, officer is looking for a reading score of 13. Joe scores 14. Do you hire Joe? Now, let's say that this reading test also has a 95% confidence interval of plus or minus 3. This means that if Joe took the test again, he could get as low as 11, which is below the required reading score. These are simplified examples, of course. But in this case, if Joe is hired on the job and cannot actually read the technical manuals, he puts lives at risk because he's maintaining aircraft engines. Therefore, in this situation, you would say, OK, he's actually got just over the cut score of 13. But what we really should do is say, we want Joe perhaps to take the test again. Because he could have scored less than this, even though he could have scored higher. Or you could say, well, let's get Joe in and see how well he can do some of the tasks. And you might have a, a trial period where he's not actually reading and maintaining uh, aircraft engines, but he's working with someone who does and they are watching him while he's attempting job. Now, here, you're, you're looking at a, a situation where you're doing further evaluation to see whether or not the score of 14 is a just score, a true score, um, or whether or not he's not up to it. You may, even if he isn't, you may then decide to invest in training. After a couple of weeks, you may decide to hire him. If you don't have those resources, you may just say, no, 14 is too risky. We will not hire Joe. You can see here that reliability and levels of uncertainty feed directly into our understanding of the inferences that we draw from scores and therefore the decisions that we make. And that's why reliability, consistency, is understood as a component of validity. Unless we can demonstrate reliability and understand our levels of uncertainty, it's very difficult to make sound decisions. This is the third and final section. Um, and in this section, we're looking at reliability as agreement. And this can be between times or administrations of a test or between raters. And raters are, of course, the human judges uh, in performance tests. Um, Cronbach's alpha is for closed response, and those, of course, are tests like multiple choice, and we're just looking at the response to an item. When it comes to performance tests, tests of speaking or of writing, um, we are looking at raters, human judges, um, and in this case, reliability as agreement can be 
between raters, and that's when we ask whether one rater agrees with another rater, in other words, the consistency between raters, or indeed the consistency of one rater with themselves marking or scoring the same language samples, and that's intra-rater reliability. So correlation is about association, and here we talk about covariance. In other words, it asks the question, as the scores increase on one variable, do they increase on another variable? And this is about administration, the example I've got here. And the, we're asking the question, are the scores consistent over two administrations of a form? So the same learners take the same form uh, at two times and we then plot the scores from the learners over time y and time x um, and see what scores they get. And as you can see from the uh, scatter plot here, there is a linear relationship between the scores in time y and time x. Low scores on one time tend to be low on the second time. There's a bit more spread as you go up, so the learners who are, get the higher scores, there's a little bit more spread up there, but it's nothing to be hugely uh, concerned about. Um, so we can see that uh, here we've got quite strong covariance, um, a line uh, going from the bottom left up to the top right. Um, these do correlate and there we here we can say our test is pretty reliable. Um, I'm going to show you how to calculate the correlation coefficients in a, a moment, uh, but it, this shows that it's pretty reliable just from the scatter plot um, uh, and this means that in over administrations um, we have managed to reduce error and that's asking the question you know the, the way in which we set the rooms up the way in which the invigilators operate you know have we got all of that under control um, and do the learners tend to respond in similar ways across time if that's the kind of error you're interested in okay <clears throat> now a correlation is expressed as a number between minus one and plus one. If we have a correlation of zero, that means there is no relationship between the two variables. If the uh, correlation is one, r equals one, that means as the value goes up on the first variable, it goes up in exactly the same way on the second variable. So all of those crosses form an exact straight line from the bottom left to the top right of a scatter plot. If it's minus one, that means as the uh, score goes up on one variable, it comes down on the other. So that means they are inversely related. Now, most of our correlations are between zero and one. Variables do tend to be related. And how do we understand the strength of a correlation, the strength of the association between two variables? Well, we just take the correlation coefficient and we square it. Now, I've got an example here, which is if correlation r equals 1, 1 squared is 1, so the two variables overlap completely. In other words, one of the variables is unnecessary. And in the diagram, the two boxes would be just one box over each other. Now, this is an example <clears throat> where the correlation is 0.32. And if we square 0.32, so 0.32 squared is 0.10 or 10%. And that means that the two variables overlap 
10%. Now, if this were two raters, for example, then uh, this would mean that when the raters give scores to students on a speaking assessment, and you use two raters, they only agree 10% in 10% of cases. And the rest of it is disagreement or error, because we are defining disagreement as error, and reliability is agreement. That is the true score, where raters agree. So that's the strength of association. <clears throat> Let's look at precisely that example. Here we have two raters, and the raters have been asked to mark 20 scripts. Um, these are scripts that learners have been given an essay prompt. They've had to write, produce a piece of writing, and we've given the scripts to two raters and asked them to score on a scale of one to six. So you can see here that with script one, rater one scores two, rater two scores two. They agree perfectly. For script two, rater one's given five and rater two's given two. That's quite a lot of disagreement in there. Three, three, six, five, two, two, and so on, all the way down to script 20. And our question is, how strong is the association between the two raters? In other words, what is the inter-rater reliability? Are they consistent? Because consistency is our definition of reliability. Okay, so they mark them. And I can tell you now, I'll show you how to calculate this in a second, but R equals 0.83, that is 83, uh, the, the association is 0.83. And when we square R to understand it as a percentage, and R squared is 0.69. So they have 69% shared variance. And that means that 31% is different. And if you look at the scores and you go back, you can see where that 31% is. And I think, you know, a lot of it comes down to that script two. When you find that you have, say, 31% error in the system, as we have here, Sometimes there are examples and you can go back and you can get hold of script two and you can say, right, is there something different about script two that has made these raters disagree? And you can go back to the two raters and say, why did you give five? Why did you give two? It may be that they're using a rating scale that um, they interpret differently. It may be that um, the descriptors on the rating scale do not describe some of the scripts that you're getting. Right, on the screen now, you can see SPSS with um, exactly the um, same data that we were looking at on the slide. And I will show you how to calculate this um, and how you can use the results um, in a, an assignment or a dissertation. So we have two raters, rater 1, 2, and down here we have 20 scripts. Now here you'll notice, if I go into the variable view again, I've said that these measures are ordinal. That is, the difference between 1 and 2 is not necessarily the same as the difference between 3 and 4, because it's a rating scale rather than a scale created out of lots of items. This is, you could have it as a, um, a scale rather than ordinal. Um, technically they are ordinal, but sometimes we treat them as scales. Doesn't matter for the moment, because we're looking at association using correlation. So all we do is put the scores in the columns and then how do we calculate correlation? 
analyze and when we go down the list of options you will see correlate we in applied linguistics and language testing use bivariate correlation so I will click on that and the correlation that we use when we have uh, scores on scales or we're uh, looking at the association between say reading tests and so on we use the what is called the Pearson product moment correlation and here you can see it comes up as the default option in SPSS because it's also the correlation coefficient that is used widely in uh, uh, not, not only applied linguistics and language testing but social sciences. <clears throat> rater 1 and rater 2 I've already put them in the right hand box they do start off here but I'll shift them over rater 1 and rater 2 these are our two variables and then I click on OK and here I have the output so you can see here that the Pearson correlation is 0 0.834 or 0 0.84 um, and it tells us the significance which is lower than 0 0.05 which is always anything lower than 0 0.05 means it's significant that is there is a significant association anything above 0 0.05 means it's random so this is a significant association but you will notice it doesn't give us r squared now at the beginning of this I showed you the diagram the scatter plot and the scatter plot helps to understand the meaning of that strength of association as well so in uh, an assignment or a dissertation you'd give the correlation coefficient you'd give r squared which is the percentage of shared variance um, and you would probably include a scatter plot now how would you get a scatter plot so back up to the um, menu at the top and now I want you to click on graphs and there it is just to the right of analyze and go down to legacy dialogues and in legacy dialogues you can see all the kinds of charts and diagrams that we can generate uh, in SPSS now if you go down to scatter and dot and click on that now all we want for this we've got two raters so we want a simple scatter define and I've put rater 1 on the y-axis rater 2 on the x-axis um, if we you see they just move backwards and forwards like that so you put them in and down here we have OK and that produces a graph for us and you can see where the dots are so rate of 1 6 6 6 and 5 for rate of 2 rate of 1 6 and 4 and so on. now one thing you can do here is double click on the graph a chart editor comes up and one of the things you can do is put in a line that shows you the best fit between rater 1 and rater 2 and that is in this line here and if you go along to 1 2 3 4 5 in and I click on that and it says fit a line and you can see that it's put a line along the chart which is which minimizes the distance between each of the dots and the line and when you close it will remain in there 
you can then shut it down and it appears on the dot okay and this is the coefficient that tells you y equals 0 0.13 plus 1 1.5 multiplied by x which gives you the uh, if you only had the scores from uh, rate of 1 how you would calculate the score that you would expect from rate of 2 but most importantly for us is now on the chart in the top right we get r squared because we've put that line in so we get r squared on the chart now again the great thing for us is we can now right click on that chart we can copy and then we can paste it directly into a word document so that's how to calculate Pearson it's how to create a scatter plot it's how to fit a line the line of best fit between uh, the uh, raters and to put R squared into the plot we're now at the end of this session on reliability so what I want to do is just to recap on the the critical issues surrounding reliability bullet points on the left first we frequently calculate reliability as internal consistency and that's usually when we're dealing with closed response items and tests uh, an internal consistency the most important measure of which is Cronbach's alpha which is endemic in the applied linguistics and social science literature the standard error is really really important and I despair sometimes when I see reports uh, that have ha have a, a quantitative methodology component and the standard error is not reported um, if they give me the data I can calculate it for myself but frequently I don't have the information that allows me to calculate the standard error this is a fundamental failing of uh, of literature in our field the standard error is critical in these kinds of assessments to understanding how much error there is in our measurement the third one is we treat agreement or high levels of association as consistency and any lack of consistency as error and that's particularly the case if we have multiple forms of a test agreement between forms um, agreement between administrations or agreement between raters and those are the examples I've given you in, in this class and then moving over to the bullet points on the right reliability is all about estimating levels of uncertainty because if we don't know how uncertain we've got to be about how we interpret these scores then we don't know how to manage risk in the kinds of decisions that we take and is a risk in one situation the same as the risk in another does it impact where we put cut scores and a whole other area of research is how we arrive at cut scores in tests what the cut scores mean and how our uncertainty and our risk management plays in to establishing those cut scores and training people how to make decisions I think this is really really important and I wish people would take it much much more seriously I hope you've enjoyed um, listening to me ramble on about this and I hope that you find it as exciting as I do and if you do um, a quantitative study uh, either in a, in a for an assessment or in your dissertation then uh, 
please come back watch this again uh, and make sure you do a really terrific job um, I hope you've enjoyed the class um, and I hope that you have a much better understanding now about how we use some of these statistics in language testing and applied linguistics research. Thank you.